Hey guys, Jim Hoffman here for What Would Jim Do? Let me get rid of this little picture here. Um, thanks for joining me today, guys. Uh, today, uh, I didn't get a lot of questions, although I did send out an email to everybody. Um, but I guess we're a little busy these days. Uh, up here in upstate New York, looking for a big snowstorm coming tomorrow. So, uh, getting prepared for that a little bit. But today... I'm going to talk a little bit about a question I got last week about the differences between CPR and CCR, okay? So CCR or, or cardiocerebral resuscitation, right? They asked what EMS's point of view is on this. Now, actually, a lot of EMS systems now uh, are sort of pushing this CCR, okay, or or uh, minimally up uh, interrupted um, cardiac resusc resuscitation, okay, or continuous um, compressions, they call it, right? So this sort of resuscitation, mainly for adult cardiac arrest patients, uh, you're not going to be using it for patients that are pediatric, usually like less than eight years old, Patients that drown, drug overdosing patients, trauma patients, respiratory arrest patients. Um, a lot of those patients are not included when it comes to a CCR or continuous compression uh, sort of protocol. Now, every system is different, and a lot of different protocols that are out there are going to vary on what different ways and the different procedures that you might do uh, this. Okay, now. This is primarily also geared as well towards um, the layperson, right? Because you got the, the people out there who don't want to do mouth-to-mouth, -mouth, right? So they come up with this idea of doing continuous compression, all right, or the CCR, okay? But at the same time, they realize there's an, an increase in um, uh, a success of return of spontaneous circulation, Okay, um, so, but when it comes to the EMS end of it, they're still, you know, talking about doing this uninterrupted chest compressions, okay, before uh, a rhythm analysis, before you start intubating patients, before you start transporting patients, okay, um, and now for most places in EMS, the CCR or this, this continuous compressions is really for the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest patients that they, you sort of presume that they're going to be uh, cardiac in nature, okay? Um, people that, you know, have a sudden collapse, um, there's no breathing or there's absent breathing, okay? These are the patients that as a provider you find this out, you're going to do the continuous press compressions for, okay? Now, when it comes to the question being asked, the differences between the two and EMS's point of view on it, again, a lot of EMS systems are starting to implement this continuous compressions um, before you start doing other things. Um, a lot of them say uh, do CPR for five minutes before you even start to uh, evaluate the rhythm if we start to do the intubations and drugs and all that good stuff, right? Because the the, the quality CPR and electricity is what ends up really saving patients out in the field. Okay, so again, other situations like the drowning and things like that, um, American Heart Association still recommend that you do the standard ACLS for those patients, okay? So the basic guidelines are EMS gets there. They should be, you know, for, for a patient like this, um, you, they're talking 200 uninterrupted chest compressions, about 100 a minute, and this is done before you do a rhythm, a rhythm analysis and a single shock, okay, if it's indicated. And then what you're going to do immediately after that is another 200 chest compressions and repeat that analysis again. Okay, now you don't move the patient for CCR, you don't move them from the scene until you get three cycles of this 200 compressions, 100 per minute, and rhythm analysis going on. Okay, so, and a lot of times, and a lot of systems now too, they're not encouraging you to even transport patients, okay, until you do have that or return of spontaneous circulation or, the, or you're able to pronounce the patient dead at the scene.
Okay. Now, CCR is different from CPR because you've got the airway management a lot of times is delayed until you either got more rescues on scene, and most of the time it's limited to just an OPA, you know, the oral pharyngeal airway, or and, and just giving oxygen, okay, by non rebreather math, not even using a BVM, okay. Things like uh, doing a more advanced um, airway, things like that. That's not really performed until you get a return of spontaneous circulation or, again, after that three cycles of the chest compressions. Uh, and when you need it, of course, you're going to defibrillate. Okay. Now, when you do a lot in this sort of uh, uh, protocol, if you are going to end up doing uh, bag valve mass or using a, a, a rescue airway of some type, you got to watch the... Uh, the ventilations, right? They don't want you going any more than eight or ten. A lot of times, even as few as six breaths per minute. Okay. The ideal thing is to get those chest compressions going. A lot of times, you might even see them using that metronome, where it go ahead and counts your compressions for you. Okay. And you attach that to your defibrillator, and it sort of helps you kind of focus on the importance of that rate of a hundred per minute and that two hundred. Uh, you know, uh, uh, compression before you do an analysis. Remember, guys, full chest recoil after each compression is essential. What they're trying to do is get that that perfusion going, get that going inside the circulatory system, and not so much worried about uh, the airway. Now, what I do want to show you guys, okay, I don't want to go too much on and on here with this, but what I do want to show is the uh, a, a protocol that goes over step by step, okay, what a paramedic would do uh, on this sort of uh, version of CPR. So remember, CPR is still in the picture, okay, we're still doing CPR, we're still doing that end of it. But this here is, we're talking about the initial uh, steps when you get on the scene and what we're doing when we take over from the layperson, okay? It's not the, the, the not doing 200, 200, 200, and not doing anything else. There are other steps that we're doing. They talk about getting Epi on board, things like that, getting the IV established. So I want to take a look at this protocol so you guys can take a look. Let's just bring that up. Just bear with me just one second while I do that. Where are we here? Here we go. All right. So here is a protocol. This is from... Um, I believe a Wisconsin uh, protocol here, and this is for the uh, non-ALS EMTs. Look at the ALS in the second two button, of course, seeing safety, you can check for responsiveness. But all of that really is is just shaking the victim and seeing if they're okay. Okay. Then, abnormal breathing, you're not giving breath, you're not re you know, reviving the airway, things like that. Um, you're just looking for pretty much for the breathing. A call for help, and, and in this case, the help is going to be calling for an ALS intercept. And then here we go. We, we talk about going right into chest compressions and getting those pads on for rhythm analysis. Okay. Um, and again, they it's all about not interrupting chest compressions. Okay. You got somebody else attaching the pads, somebody else is doing the analysis, all that great stuff. Okay. Your AED usage, again. 200 compressions is, is what they recommend. It's over two minutes, so it's 100 per minute. Using that metronome to keep you on track, okay, with your compressions, all right? And again, you are not going to, you're going to try as best you can not to interrupt compressions, okay? You're going to wait until that clear is, is done before you take your hands off the patient, okay? And again, air oxygen. Pretty simple. All you're going to do, all airway, now would be the mask, right? IV, if you're not, again, you talk about how many rescuers you're going to have on scene, who can do it, are they able to do it, okay, to get the IV. And then you got moving the transport, going on to more invasive uh, airways, okay, things like that. But again, the transport, if signs of life appear, okay, and they want you, again, consider staying and continuing. If you're going to get ALS there soon, okay, or if, um, you know, the, the, the patient, you're going to end up passing the patient dead. Now, here they say combi 2, you know, it could be a king airway, it could be an ET tube. It's going to depend upon protocols, guys. All this, this is just general knowledge, guys. Don't go by this, you know, as a set in stone type of process, but these are sort of the common steps you're going to take. 
if you are doing the continuous compressions uh, when you first come upon a patient, um, you know, in cardiac arrest, that you consider as cardiac in nature. Now, the rest of it's all transport, documentation, all that great stuff, all important. I'm not going to go into that too much here right now, okay? But there are some issues here for discussion. Right, thinking about things about about maintaining the airway. You know, if the patient's vomited, you're going to consider about doing ET tubes and copies uh, a little quicker, right? After suctioning for those types of patient. Okay, and again, talking about the metronome, all these type of things that you need to uh, record time because the time is, is important to understand the patient's downtime and their potential for survivability. Now, for the ALS intercept, pretty much, you know. You're going to go ahead and, as a, as a paramedic, get all your information, uh, find out there's an IV established, all that type of stuff, right? Talking about the combi tube. And as a paramedic and as the, the provider you get there, you got to watch out for the over-ventilation, right? The hyperventilation. You want to try to keep it down to that eight, eight per minute, usually not more than six, okay? Do your IV line. And then talk about your vasopressors, your epi, your vasopressin, okay? And then your amiodarone, okay? And again, this is for your uh, recurrent shockable rhythm, V-fib or V-tag, pulses V-tag. ALS, of course, is switching to your monitor, and then you're going to do the same stuff pretty much after that, right? Talking about moving when is appropriate to move to the ambulance, more invasive airway, more ventilations, uh, transporting, and getting all of the information that you need to present to the hospital when you get there. So, again, guys, it's a little different, right? Not exactly uh, the same as CPR because they're focusing on the continuous compressions, not so much on the, um, you know, the, the, the CPR end of it and getting the airway and start getting drugs and the IV and all that stuff. They want to focus, when you first get there, focusing on the compressions because they've been showing that this method of intervention when you get on scene as either the lay person or the, the EMS providers has been increasing the return of spontaneous circulation. But the point I think that we have to think about as providers is to look at the steps that I showed and think about how we have to keep on track. A lot of times as EMS providers, guys, we get sort of stuck in that mode of not changing or just going through the motions of what we're what we're comfortable with, what we've been trained. It's it's sort of um, unnatural for us, right? to just do CPR, just, I mean, just do compressions at 200 uh, compressions without even thinking about using a BVM, putting a non-rebreather. How many times have you seen firemen or first responders working cardiac arrest and the patient, you get there and the patient's dead and they have a non-rebreather on their face and you run around, oh my God, all they would do, all they did was have a non-rebreather on their face. They weren't even bagging the guy. But we have to get past that, right? That is not the way things are done anymore. The full process is more about getting that compressions going um, and, and trying to reverse the electrical aspect of what's going on. Okay, so keep that in mind. Don't get stuck in old ways. Think about the way that things get done nowadays and what we can do as providers to help our patients by by embracing these types of changes and this type of research that shows that continuous compressions like this can help our patients, okay? So just, guys, keep that in mind. Don't get stuck in the past, and, you know, remember that it's the research that we have to follow. It's not about history when it comes to a lot of the patient care and treatment modalities that we're doing. EMS is changing, and it's, I think it's up to us as providers to sort of embrace this change and be able to move it forward as well. It's not just about our uniforms and the equipment that we're using. It's the treatment that we're giving. Guys, I hope this maybe cleared up just a little bit, maybe uh, thought some, put some thoughts in your head, and maybe if you're not doing this in your agency, you can go ahead and give it a shot. You know, bring it to your medical director's attention and, uh, you know, maybe go ahead and get them doing it. So have some questions of your own. Be sure to post them in the comments below. Until next week, as always, Jim Hoffman from What Would, what would Jim Do? Stay safe.